please start sharing your screens so welcome everybody to this uh, uh, webinar uh, today and it is uh, a webinar with a difference because it is a aios master class by the master blaster himself and that is dr abhay vasavada uh, on anterior vitrectomy for cataract surgeons a topic uh, which you know all cataract surgeons uh, really want to understand and know about in a topic that is pioneered by him uh, we have uh, dr barun naik who is the president of all india ophthalmological society uh, and we have it's in fact a, a pleasure and honor for me to introduce uh, our speaker uh dr abhay vasavada who actually needs no introduction uh he is the founder director of ragudeep eye hospital and nila devi cataract and eye research center in ahmedabad india developed several techniques and has made important contributions to the understanding and practice of uh, not only adult cataract surgery but also pediatric cataract surgery and distinguished member of various international ophthalmic societies across the world in fact he is one person who's placed india in on the global uh, educational uh, map of the uh, uh, ophthalmology awarded the arthur limoration by asia pacific uh, association of cataract and refractive surgeons being cost gold medal in 2011 by the american society of cataract and refractive surgery india's best researcher award uh, dr b c roy award and an honorary doctorate by the university of hungary he is the current president of the asia pacific association of cataract and refractive surgeons and to his credit there are numerous publications several chapters and scientific uh, magazine articles and he's uh, done so many randomized control studies in the field of cataract surgery which has completely changed the way we do our clinical practice and of course he is a teacher of teachers and has trained several national and international uh, ophthalmologists Uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Rajesh Sena, to, uh, who's the honorary treasurer of All India Ophthalmological Society, to uh, introduce the expert panel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Namrata, and uh, we have a couple of uh, wonderful experts with us, who are great friends and wonderful surgeons and great clinicians. Dr. Priya Narang, who is the director of Narang Eye Care and Laser Centre, Ahmedabad. has done a training at ahmedabad uh, at the pj medical college and then has numerous achievements she has served as consultant for focal uh, nodal points teaching program at ao she has uh, her videos chosen to be part of global video contest at ao she has a video blog as well she, she has received several awards like gold medal for, by the uh, irsi then the paper on glue assisted intraocular fixation of posterior chamber intraocular lens has won the gold award for the best paper in 2013 by indian journal of ophthalmology she has received the surgical skill award by was she has also received the vikram dalewal gold medal award for surgical excellence and international ophthalmologist education award by aao she has done many innovations and the no assistant technique for glue dial was something which was really Uh, wonderful she has something more some more also single pass four through people plasty she keeps doing handshake riveting technique for secondary eye fixation trocar assisted eye dialysis repair and the most recent one the advanced vision analyzer that is uh, virtual reality automated perimeter that is something which is the most really recent one the very useful it's equine i guess Then we have with us Dr. Harshwit Tak, another dear friend, senior consultant at Rawat Peko Surgery Center, Jaipur, and uh, he is also director of Jaipur Laser Vision Center, Jaipur, and the chairman, scientific committee of Rajasthan Ophthalmology Society. He is also member ARC Central Zone AIOS and assistant editor uh, IGO Cataract Section and executive member of IRSI. He is also governing council member of uh, Indian Society of Cataract, uh, Cornea and Cataract Refractive Surgeons, and immediate past secretary of Jaipur Ophthalmological Society. He is past Central Zone representative of FBS AIOS, and uh, uh, currently the member uh, the state representative for Rajasthan for FBS AIOS, and also past editor general of Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society. and the chief organizing secretary of glaucopedia he has uh, received various awards and honors he has coined the term hydro implantation 
in ophthalmology and we have seen his uh, surgeries uh, of, high, of hydro implantation. And uh, he has also been awarded the Surinarayan gold medal and the Surveer Singh gold medal uh, for uh, for his uh, presentations. So we welcome Dr. Harshul Tak and Dr. Priya Naran to this wonderful session that will be, you know, started soon. So thank you. So we request sir uh, to please share his screen for his uh, masterclass. Yes. Well, first, uh, I do receive research grant support from Alcon, but it has no relevance. And I take this opportunity to wish all of you here who are listening a very happy Independence Day. And we are so proud of our Javans that are uh, doing all the hard work for us and sacrifices. But, but the key is this AIOS. And I've seen the change since Namrata Sharma as a secretary and his, her entire team has uh, taken over. So much of education and a real education, I've never seen anywhere else in my uh, rather long career. So congratulations to Amrita and the entire AOS team, scientific committee and everybody, uh, you know, who really has changed and then people have started recognizing and attending uh, AIOS webinars from all over the corners. So Amrita and the team, thank, thank you. you so very much. Thank you. Now, uh, this is a rather familiar situation. And once this happens, you know uh, what uh, the feeling you have and your heart is in the mouth and you really uh, stop uh, decelebrated, your, your higher control uh, disappears. And that's where the moment of truth comes, actually. And then uh, we have had a traditional way of management. And, and uh, over the years, many experts of me and many others that we need to think a little differently and take a path uh, which has not been taken up by Catholic surgeon when, when you find an unforeseen uh, or a planned uh, uh, situation where you need to address the vitreous in the area of the Catholic surgeon. Now, I'm going to uh, address this problem mainly related to the capsule rupture. Uh, sir, sir, there's some, some, sorry, sorry to disturb, sir. There's some yes, right, on the right yes. side. There is some band which is coming. Anand, can we uh, can we sort this out? Sir, can you stop sharing it and again start sharing, sir? There is okay, a vertical one. band which is coming on the it right. It must be coming on your computer, sir. It's covering yeah. your computer. So. Stop yeah, share, sir. Uh, yeah, there's a box share. New share, is it? Yeah, just stop share, sir, right now, and then new share, sir. Stop video, huh? No. Mm -hmm. Pause, pause, pause. Yeah, I'm, I'm just or? stopping your sharing, sir. Yeah, okay. uh, you do that if you can do it for me. Just Please. a second, sir. Try again, sir. Right. Uh, wait a minute. Sh uh, share screen again. Still coming. Still coming, sir. No, it is coming. Uh... It's a box coming on your right side, sir. So how will that go? We need Again? To, is it a nuisance? I can't see it myself. Nee, it's okay. That's it. Though. It's not that bad. But it will come on the no, it'll come on the slide. Yeah, it's now coming it, on the slide. It's decreased now. It's getting it less. It's getting less. Now I think it's we can continue. We can continue. Continue now. Okay. So the, I'm going to limit or sort of mainly focus on the need for vitrectomy during the cataract surgery, uh, primary cataract surgery. However, we realized that for secondary IOL implantation, also uh, we have a situation, but uh, that's a different topic. And I, I believe that we need to have a, what is happening here? Click on the slide, sir. 
Speak on the slides. I can't see the slide. My slides are gone. I I, we can see your desktop, sir, now. So I think we'll have to. Not sir. Okay, this the slide. Way. You have to go again, sir. It's in keynote. Can you connect me? Can, can you connect me? You think or I don't have your presentation, sir. Sir, sir you'll have to unshare. There is a keynote, sir. There is a keynote in the bottom, sir. You can see next to the musical sign, sir. Just take your mouse to the bottom, sir. Keynote. You can see, sir. There is a musical note in the bottom, just left to that. Yes, this one. I oh, know this one. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Now, fine, sir. Fine. All okay, sir. Okay. So, the, for the second AI implementation, I believe we need to have a co-management with retinal colleague, but but that's a different topic altogether. So when the posterior capsule rupture, first thing is to keep very calm and obviously we don't have to panic. What I do is to, I stand up from my chair uh, and my assistant uh, understands and gets the vitrectomy uh, ready and fix it up. And I sit back again on my chair. I change my reset the PD, which was actually all right, but I, I redo it again and tell myself, this is a situation stand by my friend. How can I help him? So that mental approach is very important so that uh, you, you can understand what's happening. And first thing is to keep uh, the instrument inside the eye and inject, I believe, this coat. Uh, and that also will create a barrier effect on the exposed uh, vitreous, but, but it will prevent the forward bulge of that, you can use methyl cellulose. I would recommend this code because this code, methyl cellulose and the cellulose of it, the vitreous can produce vitreitis. So even if you are not using chondroitin sulfate, use chondroitin sulfate. And once you do that, you have a time now. Extent of the PCR, identify, and then backup strategy. And in these modern times, we always should have a backup three piece and various other options of your choice. So here we are, uh, we have a PCR and we are injecting triumph cinnolone. And then thanks to this triumph cinnolone, which stains the vitreous after uh, assessing the extent of the PCR, that will allow us to identify the presence of it into the, our field. And triumph cinnolone can be used in pediatric cataract surgery as a routine where we have to open up the capsule anyway. But, but the key is that really this is the great stuff and those who are not using it, please keep that ready always in the theater and then you can be embarrassed by, by seeing a week of vitreous going to the incision, however small or big. When the vitreous phase is disrupted and only part of it is removed, the symmetry of the vitreous scaffold is disturbed. So you need to identify that vitreous there and having done that i'm taking that picture again the one i started with and i'm doing that uh, staining again and now i have the uh, option of doing the parts plan so what i'm doing is uh, making a part on my entry i'll come back to it how you make it but just to illustrate uh, that see that the vitreous is being drained into the vitrector without disturbing the post capsule tear or anti chamber, it's very tranquil and the vitreous will simply be drained through that rupture uh, and, and the area of work will be vitreous free. So pars plana allows us to do that uh, very predictably and in a controlled manner. And then you can have a strategy of removing the remaining matter and then uh, you have a choice. Uh, you can lift this fragments up in the anti chamber or use various supporting devices, but I don't uh, recommend that. If you're doing a good vitrectomy, vitreous is not in your area and you can use the low parameters and you notice that I'm using very CC flow rate instead of 25, 30, 35 and, and sufficient vacuum but more energy. And I'm removing the same eye here with, with fragment and I'm not worried about uh, frag, uh, vitreous coming in. My, my B-well is actually facing down uh, to avoid the endothelium. If you see my B-well, I'm, I'm trying to keep it away. So the point 
if the vitreous is not in the area of the cataract surgeon, uh, you can remove these fragments uh, with the low parameters and low uh, input. Before we get into this, let's understand some of the basics of anatomy of the vitreous and the eye. This is the pars plicata region and pars plana. Both are ciliary body. And then the ora serrata camps. Now, now, this is very important. And uh, uh, there are different opinions about it, but pars plicata extend up to two millimeter and then up to four is pars plana. So entire ciliary body of pars plana and plicata is four millimeters. So ideal would be to avoid plicata uh, as an entry point for sutures or for vitrectomy. And regular surgeons recommend 3.5 millimeter, but that can be anything from three to four, but certainly in that region that you want to enter, even uh, for intravitreal injection. Uh, meaning that, and I'll come to that uh, later on. So that, that's very important because uh, we want not to go to the forward, not to go too much uh, posterior. And that's what Dr. Samresh Srivastava showed me in his Miyake view that if you're one millimeter or 1.5, you can actually be very close uh, to the zonular apparatus or, or to the plicata. So, so that you need to keep in mind, and instead, if you are in two millimeter zone, you are at the border of the plicata and pars plana, and then you're really not injuring this highly immune-rich uh, uveal tissue in the plicata region. And this is Jan uh, talking to us about various spaces and various septa, and they are very important for a cataract surgeon, uh, and this is the uh, animation Dr. Shettle made it for me, and these are all tracks attached on the base and on the posterior segment. And see what happens. This is the anti-catural tear, and with continuous phaco emulsification, the tear extends around the inferior, and the lens starts sinking. Now, because you can see that, it is within your reach. And you think, I can grab it with bandits or forceps, or, or even a vitrectomy to limbal root. Uh, but that's dangerous because as you can see here, with that moment, the vitreous is prolapsing, but there is a traction coming here and there. So remember this diagram, uh, and you will see a giant hair being initiated and a an macular traction. So do not, uh, do not place any, any instrument, lavaging, for example, uh, which was uh, suggested by Lake. Dr. Kelman, with all due respect, is quite dangerous. So instead, say bye-bye, and this is a goodbye technique. Let it sink, because you can see that these tracks, when you, if you remove this nucleus, which is surrounded by vitreous, you will produce a lot of traction there. These are the tracks Jan was described, and anything trying to grab this with anywhere, whether, whether it is in the anterior chamber, anterior vitreous or mid vitreous, you are inviting trouble and producing vitreous retinal traction. So I would recommend uh, just let it go. Dr. Shamare Srivastava also showed uh, on an award-winning video what happens as a surgeon when you use a lot of high parameters, high bottle height and high aspiration for it. This is a cadaver eye, uh, not necessarily happening in the live human eye, but it, it is a possibility in some eyes. Uh, irrigation on and off, and the entire vitreous phase of intact, intact capsule uh, is moving forward and backward. Now we increase the bottom height and the flow rate from 20 to 40 cc flow rate and see what happens. Still the posterior capsule is intact. Posterior capsule is not ruptured, but see the movement of the entire capsule and anti the injector triumphs in alone in the anterior chamber, and through the intact capsule, the triumphs in alone leaked into the vitreous. So the point is that high turbulence and high fluctuation can increase the permeability of the capsule diaphragm and can leak out, and maybe this is one of the reasons for cystoid macular edema. But vitreous physiologists have told me that it is an increased risk, oxidative stress on the trabecular end, 
uh, endothelial meshwork, if the entry of the clear space is disrupted. So whatever we do, we don't want to do that. But here is a situation where it is disrupted. So what is the goal of vitrectomy? First of all, you need to do vitrectomy. We must understand. You cannot shy away, inject air, and then close the eye. As I have done in my early 70s in my housemanship in Baroda. Don't do that. Always perform vitrectomy. And what is the goal of vitrectomy? The primary goal, if I have to single out one aim, it is preventing intraoperative acute vitreoretinal traction. That's your main aim, not to salvage the sinking lens material anyhow. Let it drop. Your, your, as a Catholic surgeon, your aim is not to keep the lens material in the entry chamber anyhow. Don't do that. Just let it go. So other aims and benefits is that if you do you know, vitrectomy properly in a right way, you can prevent further enlargement of PCR and therefore you can put the lens in the bag in some cases. And also will allow you to remove the vitreous very adequately, uh, provided you produce a symmetric uniform removal of the vitreous. You can support the IOL uh, in, into using that support. But whatever method you do, limbo, parse, plana, please and please do not perform dry vitrectomy, hypotony is little. Please never perform sponge vitrectomy or a, a cotton swab and so on with the scissors because Steve Charles, uh, with whom he the course in various settings, taught me that it will produce acute intravitreal, intraoperative retinal traction. So you can have a choice and you can do limbal or pastrana. Nothing is wrong with any of these, but let's understand what happens with what. Before we do that, when do I do it to me? Anytime earliest. Here's another case. We encountered a PCR early Anytime in the time when you when you when you encounter the vitreous. Here is a case uh, in the beginning, it's the very end, somewhere midway, but this is a metro cataract with zonular dialysis never known as a dead vitreous. Now, what do you do with metro cataract? First, so we'll come to that in a minute, but, but anytime, whenever you see vitreous disturbance, you need to address it before you perform the vitreous uh, cataract surgery. And uh, you have this limbal approach, which is uh, very good and has showed us many years and has done a, quite a decent job, sure that you go right into the incision, sub-incisional to prevent incarceration uh, when, you, when you perform that. And it's always seen along as we showed earlier. So limbal approach has the appeal. It is a very familiar territory for many senior surgeons. Those who are in the beginning may not be. And has therefore has become a routine, like I did it was routine, when I was doing a cataract surgery in early 70s. So it has become a routine to perform a limbal vitrectomy, and that's fair enough. However, the problem is that now we understand that it causes more intraoperative traction on the vitreoretinal interface than the other approach. And typically, post-capsule, which is a small, typically enlarges moment to start vitrectomy, and the fragments sink, post segment. And that's for uh, some people use, and uh, Priya would tell more about it on the on the scaffold technique and so on. But but that's because uh, the limbal approach of vitrectomy, the, the those uh, vitreous is removed, and then the lens fragment is not supported and then sinks. And therefore, primary objective of IRL in the bag placement may not be achieved with this technique, uh, but not necessarily. And, and somebody once again showed us beautifully in his the wool experiment what ha can happen to the tear when you drag the vitreous from top to bottom, from, from the from anterior to posterior, typically tear and largeness. And he once again showed and published this slow motion technique of what a turbulence uh, is produced when you do limbal vitrectomy, particularly if you go through that tear to, to achieve that anterior vitrectomy and if it is removal, and that, that, that vitreous is dragged forward and will enlarge the tear uh, straight away. So uh, this is the consequences of limbal approach, but that still is a viable option and continue doing it 
until you master the parts plan approach. But this is something you all should aim to perform one day if you're not doing already. And, and that's because the traction is minimal on the vitreoretinal interface during the surgery, and therefore the consequences are minimal. And the enlargement of the post capsule tear is minimized, and, and more adequate thorough vitrectomy is possible. However, it is not a familiar territory. We have never seen in the training, or it appears rather intimidating. And many people think that it needs the elaborate setup and technology, but we will see whether it does it need it. Once again, summary shows how the vitreous is drained or sucked into the vitrector, as you saw in the clinical example, with minimal impact on the, on the post capsule tear, and the slow motion where the vitrectomy in this example is through the past plan and irrigation is in the anterior chamber, uh, there is minimal turbulence, unlike you saw in the previous one, and then the tear is not impacted. How do I make this entry? Well, there are two approaches. One, uh, which I use it, uh, I'll show you first, but remember this anatomy once again, try to, try to do retinal surgeons tell us, three millimeter, 3.5, and not nearer uh, than two millimeter uh, in this case. And this will vary depending upon the age, but, but generally this is uh, a standard of uh, past prana. And this is, you can measure it if you're going to do the uh, uh, lens knife incision, but, but I use uh, more often trocar. And what I do is there, I lift the conjunctiva and slant the trocar almost horizontally, if it's possible, in top of the sclera, between the conjunctiva and sclera, not piercing the sclera. So subconjunctival travel, a millimeter or so, and then I turn 90 degree and aim the center of the globe, not the center of the pupil, not here, not here, but center of the globe, say optic nerve, direct that way, and then with a bit of gentle movement, uh, as you can see, like a screwing movement, uh, you do that. This needs a little force, and therefore you may need to suture your catheter incision if it is uh, bigger. When, once you do that, uh, that's not difficult. And then you can see the vitreous here, uh, uh, here in the anterior chamber and in the anterior face, uh, which will be drained once again to pass plan. I notice the flow rate and the bottle high and the vacuum. The whole vitreous will be drained around the lens. It went from anterior chamber to the retractor and then it, it, it just will disappear. So then uh, it's not difficult uh, to, to remove the vitreous from the anterior chamber and then you can remove the car at the very end. Uh, until that you can plug it if it's not a ball through car. And when you remove the stroke car, um, and I really thank Manish Nakpal who taught me this. Uh, just make sure that you, you indent to prevent incarceration. And when you remove the retractor also, you keep it on a cut mode uh, and not on a, on a uh, foot switch position irrigation alone. If you're going to do a lens knife or any other knife, and I use the uh, parasynthesis knife I have, which is 1.1 millimeter, uh, you need to do peritomy and then measure the, uh, measure the uh, distance from the limbus, which could be three millimeter or 3.5, depending upon the age or your comfort. And then uh, you introduce that uh, knife. Well, I have an angled knife, but a straight knife is a much better knife. And, and you can see that knife coming here uh, at the end here that I'm using that it, my finger is obstructing the view, but that, that's because of angle, but I would prefer a straight knife, uh, less knife, and that is, the, that is the distance, and that you need to suture that. Remember, this sclerotomy has to be sutured, and 10 or nylon, or nine, or whatever you want, and, and make sure that you suture very well. How does the retractor work? Uh, you can see that movement of the retractor here, uh, they call it guillotine movement, forward, backward. And the typical recommended position is the first position, irrigation, cutting, retractor, and then aspiration. Always cut first before you aspirate. Although we have an option 
of cut IA, and that can be used uh, to remove cortex or something like that, but please use cut IA mode rather than IA cut mode because it will drag on the uh, vitreous. And this is the aspiration first and then vitrectomy uh, to illustrate that you can use it, but, but you can use IA and this is also, you don't need to do that, but just to show you that you can. Now, when you perform vitrectomy, whichever way you want to perform, make sure you remove the vitreous very adequately behind the posterior capsule to produce a symmetrical removal and therefore a symmetrical support for the IOL in case you are using the, the main capsule uh, to support the IOL. And, and what forms the uh, scaffold for the IOL is not only the capsule uh, where it is ruptured in the middle, but also the vitreous phase. So I think uh, you need to, to uh, do that very well, understand, and then perform uh, the vitrectomy. Now, if you do limbal vitrectomy, uh, it's, it's possible to remove uh, the central vitreous from behind the posterior capsule quite well, but notice that there are pockets. There are pockets of uh, vitreous, even if you swap this uh, vitrector from this end to this one, it's very difficult to remove these vitreous from underneath the peripheral posterior capsule on which the IOL is going to be supported. And then you will have a, a asymmetrical removal of antivitreous, and this can fill the lens. And when you see the patient uh, on the post of time, you say the lens is very good and uh, you will expect the patient to be happy, but patient says my vision is not that good because the tilt and aberrations that it produced. So symmetrical removal of the antivitreous phase is very important for IOL stability and a quality. You can understand how effectively our plana approach can remove the antivitreous uh, in the area where the IOL entire six millimeter of the IOL optic is to be supported uh, with less chance of tilt. Once again, somebody showed this on a Miyake view. This is the limbal vitrectomy showing us uh, that there are pockets left in the in the vitreous here in this region, which you cannot remove, which you saw it in animation. And if you already have an IOL and you have to do this, it can uh, disrupt, disturb the IOL haptics, limbal approach. Instead of that, if you do limbal, uh, the, the past plana, and this is past plana vitrectomy, you can see, as you saw in animation, it's not difficult to remove uh, and then produce a symmetrical uh, complete removal uh, of the antivitreous uh, through that area. So this is an example. A vitrectomy has been done in the central region, but having done everything, I'm trying to do more vitrectomy in this entire area so that uh, when I use the IOL, and I'm, I'm lucky to use the capsule support in this case, but, but the point is that you need to do little more surrounding the tear area so that you produce a, a good, decent uh, symmetrical uh, removal and produce a good scaffold. Uh, this is an example of a query for support cataract, and it's always in the fallow eye of a tonic IOL or a multifocal that I have a problem. It's, it's a law. And here is the cataract, no capsule rupture, but IOL got tilted. There is a torque happening because of the slow release. Uh, the surgeon was rather nervous. Nothing happened, luckily. And uh, but notice here, there is some touch here, but but capsule is intact. Now to remove the vitreous, uh, to remove the OVDs, the surgeon goes behind with the irrigation behind aspiration in front of the IOL. And notice that weak spot now with the tilt of the IOL has resulted into the extension and post capsule rupture. Now, it's not a bad situation. IOL is already in the bag, and we were thinking that we should be fine, but always check it with Transcinolon. So we, we had this, uh, because of multifocal, I just wanted to make sure that it's stable. And moment I injected Transcinolon, I was a little bit uh, disappointed that there was a vitreous coming from that tail around the lens uh, from the, from the, into the antechamber. So now we have the vitreous stuck into the incision. It's been caught inside the leaves of the incision and the vitreous somewhere here in the antechamber. So option could be to cutting with the scissors 
which I would not recommend because it's very tedious and still you cannot remove it completely or a limbal. When you limbal, this is an example where it will extend and enlarge the pair and the zonules. So I would, uh, at least in this kind of situation, uh, consider pass planavitrectomy through the lens knife or a trocar. And once again, uh, you will see that the vitreous uh, here will be drained uh, from the front into the uh, post around the same route that it came through into the vitractor, uh, and then we have to cut that uh, vitreous which is caught in the incision. So this vitreous which is in the, the anterior chamber will be drained into the vitractor uh, quite uh, effortlessly uh, with, with minimal vacuum so that you don't risk the posterior capsule uh, remaining posterior capsule. And then you're then ready to to, to the uh, anterior vitrectomy because it was caught into the incision. And here you are hydrating the incisions. And this is the same eye uh, down the line. And, and you need to monitor it very carefully. And particularly if you have this kind of multifocality, uh, you have, and if you have the other instrumentation, it would be nice to ascertain uh, how stable it is. But the best part is, this particular eye, and I was lucky, I don't produce every time, no tilt and no aberration. So patient was happy, but that, that's not very common. Whatever you do, limb mole or, uh, or a pars plana, once the capsule is open, always get the retinal surgeon check on the table if possible, or immediately on the same day or next day and monitor them very carefully. One more time, uh, a blunt trauma in the left eye a year ago, uh, and uh, dimness of visions uh, since then, but worse for two weeks. And this is what he presented with. This is the one I showed you earlier, when to do vitrectomy. So I do one, this is the first incision made into the eye, and I'm planning a, a tram, uh, the trifon blue staining, and that's the standard technique. I'll be using a Helon 5 or Helon GV uh, to do that. And I'm washing out the tram silicone, but notice, there is a, some little uh, gap here, and that old trauma. I asked the anesthetist, is there a history of trauma? Because I, I, I have a forgetfulness. And yes, there was a trauma some time ago, and that, that gave me a signal. So at that stage, I had to use the triamcinolone, and I noticed that there was a vitreous coming from that gap into the little incision already and now I have a white cataract, what do I do? If I start doing cataract surgery, it will be, uh, it will extend more. So, this is something I will not recommend to uh, uh, most of you who are not very familiar with past plan approach, but, but if you are, it will do a trick and will, will change the outcome entirely as you will see now. So what I'm now planning and my aim is to disconnect Severe the connection of these vitreous, which is caught into the incision from the main body of the vitreous. So I don't know whether you can see that, but there will be some indication of a metal there. I am more posterior away from the posterior capsule so that I don't rupture the posterior capsule. And you can be, and the vitreous is so good that it will, it will, it will severe the connection from the anterior vitreous to the post. And you can see that under the incision, and you will see the tag getting free in a minute. You can see that the tag now is free from the back of the vitreous. And now I am very happy. Now I can address it and remove it. Uh, and now I can proceed as I would have done earlier. So, uh, so that, that's, that's what it is. And I did that very well. And I can show that uh, later on, but that's okay. I don't have that film, but I, I put a C on a ring there and then I did the IOL in the bag. Now I'm showing the dense cataract, not to show off, but it is possible to remove the dense cataract also. And this is the dense cataract uh, I picked up for the time sake from the time that we ruptured the capsule. The dense fragment is visible, my bevel is down. Uh, I'm not worried about that, that part here that the, the vitreous, because I've done parts of a vitrectomy, and I'm able to remove this dense cataract easily with that. And this is the early part of that procedure 
where when I had the uh, same eye, I, I took it forward and I'm showing that the track, the vitreous was removed from the empty chamber and severed the connection uh, of that, that thing. And now I'm able to, to remove these fragments at a time. So uh, you can do that and remove that without fearing of lens dropping because there is no vitreous and the flow rate is only 18, low bottle height and sufficient vacuum. Even with the bevel down, it's not going to attract the vitreous because we have done sufficient anterior vitrectomy. So you don't need to do this and it may not work every time. But the point I want to make is that if, if we had done good etiquette vitrectomy, removing vitreous from, the, uh, from area of your work and also a little bit of the anterior vitrectomy, however limited it could be, it is possible to remove the remaining less material. The amount of material or density generally doesn't matter if you've done a good vitrectomy. But remember the flow rate, uh, 12 cc flow rate, I use it for ferro or 14, uh, 300 vacuum or the low IOP. This 30 means 50, 52 centimeter bottle light, but high energy. So uh, this is just to, to tell you, and this is the same eye, I've done that sufficient removal, but notice the iris chaffing. The, because of the density, I burned the iris, and that's the price I had to pay for that. My retinal colleague was handy, and, and he checked it. Everything is fine. And then we retracted the iris, and uh, to a surprise, pleasant surprise, there was sufficient capsule, and, and then we introduced the three-piece IOL there, and, and then uh, uh, this, this is the end picture, which is quite satisfactory in the dense cataract. So how do I adapt? This is all right to show the videos and talk about it, but I have done one or two and I'm not very confident. So I think first thing is to accept this concept. The concept is that Pass plana is something you need to try. If you, if you believe that concept, convince you will try the next step. And next step is to interact with vitreous, uh, vitreous surgeon, your colleague. If you don't have in your place, talk to them, make friends, go to him once he does some pass plana entries, see the videos, and observe some of these things uh, if you're lucky to see the posterior capsule. Now, now, therefore, the road to safety, I believe, is something which is important. Uh, many of us have taken it, uh, and I'm very happy that more and more people are joining on this path, which uh, some of our stalwarts have started, and we all are in this, uh, taking this path of this. But, but I just want to, uh, with the time I have, I might show you some of these cases that I just skipped uh, earlier. Uh, hopefully now. All right. So I think uh, that should be the uh, end. I can show you more, but I think that the, the, the message is that uh, we need to cons we need to do vitrectomy and uh, whatever the option, make sure that you remove it completely. Use in alone closed chamber technique and appropriate parameters. Now for the IOL, what will you do? You have an option. You can have the uh, ciliary sulcus fixated treatment if you have sufficient capsule, but, but generally speaking, uh, many times you won't have that. So you have an option of trans fixation using uh, various grades of proline from 10 or to 5 or proline of different lenses. And Suture this with this proline or Gore-Tex, which I like Gore-Tex, and we published 100 eyes of Gore-Tex suture in, in AJO, American Journal, some time ago. Uh, and it's good uh, because they don't disintegrate. But I believe the better technique is intrascleral fixation. And uh, uh, thanks to Gabor Sherry, Dr. Maragraval, and, and uh, his team, uh, which includes Priya Narang. Uh, intrascleral fixation has caught up correctly, and that's a very good concept, but lately there is a further uh, improvement, and I call it a refinement, 
in some sense, the Yamani technique, I like that Yamani technique. So uh, whatever the technique you like, transcleral, intrascleral fixation, and I believe intrascleral fixation has an advantage, but, but uh, that's a debate and uh, you can do that. I believe in intrascleral fixation, uh, whatever that is. Uh, then IOL option is something we need to uh, consider depending upon your experience. You can do it primarily on the time of the surgery or postpone it and refer it to the person who is doing it or do it later on when you settle down, check the eye and three months down the line, the eye heals well. So that, that's where the thing, and when you do the secondary implantation, whatever the technique, please, if possible, keep the retinal colleague because at that time, you need to assess the peripheral retina for a potential retinal break really need to do a decent uh, vitrectomy, at least a core vitrectomy in these procedures. And I find many times that uh, the cataract surgeon does him or herself alone, which may be okay for few selected surgeons, but generally I strongly recommend to manage these cases in a planned fashion with, with a retinal colleagues uh, uh, handy or, or at the same time. So the patients uh, are safe. So uh, that is what I wanted to share. Uh, for a cataract surgeon, it is not difficult to learn. It is more of our mindset than the actual skill. If you can do a cataract removal, there's nothing more difficult than a cataract surgery. Antivitrectomy is not as difficult as the cataract surgery itself. So thank you so very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Are you here? So can you stop Hello. sharing, please? Yeah. Thank you, sir. It was it was uh, really very uh, elaborate, very nice presentation, and uh, you highlighted each and every point very nicely. Because Are you on exactly a mute? No, sir. Mute? We can hear Dr. Rajesh, sir. Okay. So I hear you. Check uh, Rajesh, you can't hear me, sir. I cannot hear you. We can hear him. Something. Yeah. What happened, sir? Uh, your battery may be down. Your headphones battery may have gone down, sir. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Can you hear us? Can, can sir, you can hear you anyone of us? I can't hear you, Rajesh. Sir, Rajesh. your battery may be over. Just okay. One uh, can you maybe the headphone battery is the uh, headphone battery is over yeah uh, sir can you hear us now hello, hello. can you hear us sir I can't hear you uh, I think if he logs out and log in again he may be able that to would be a good idea I'll just call him yeah, that's right. Okay. You can on. continue to discuss. Okay, okay. okay. No, you can, can you hear, hear us now. Can you hear now? Yes, I can hear you now. I can hear you. Okay. 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 So what, what I was telling that, you know, all these small little points which, you know, every surgeon feels that how exactly it should be done, how the trocar should be introduced, how uh, you know, the vitrector should be introduced and how much vitrectomy you have to do. So all these things you have covered, sir, and it was a fantastic, it was a treat to watch. A lot of things to learn, and and of course learning from the master himself. I mean, it, it was uh, it was a wonderful day, Independence Day, and a wonderful lecture from you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. There were some uh, great teaching tips out there, and I really feel that you know uh, um, uh, the in residency and uh, I mean cataract surgeons in fellowships they should be taught how to uh, place up the first planar trucar. So that is one important aspect. Uh, many places, you know, the training is lacking. So there is always an inhibition to put, oh, parts and no, no, that is meant for retinal surgeons. That mindset has to change. That is what uh, uh, I like, Dr. Basavra, saying that. And that's absolutely true because um, not many cataract surgeons are comfortable with parts plana um, and true car placing or even a sclerotomy. So they're even worried about the sclerotomy placing of a sclerotomy at parts plana. Secondly, uh, one more teaching point that I would just like to add, although he has already highlighted everything so very well, you know, uh, one of the very important and the crucial point is how 
you enter inside the eye with the vitreotomy cutting tool uh, before you enter the eye you have to check whether the cut, uh, the uh, cutting probe the it's actually the cutter is functional uh, many times you know what happens to these uh, cutters is that you might feel it is working but when you go inside and then it doesn't work and then again you come out with a bit of distraction and then you change the cutter and then you do it again so it should be done before you enter secondly when you enter um, uh, you should not be entering with the vitreotomy uh, cutting mode on it has to start once you are there in the center and you are actually seeing the uh, the cutting port and then you start the vitreotomy cut up so i think that is very important one tip and uh, beautifully um, uh, dr um, uh, savra sir has shown mm. you know even in a mature cataract he showed how mm. to do the vitreotomy and uh, from behind mm. not mm. parts mm. okay can you hear us sir yeah 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 i can hear you yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's so uh, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah and another teaching point for any beginner or even for expert people would be uh, to analyze how, when to start cutting because when you have when you're not seeing anything especially in dense cataracts you have to be very careful uh, you might not even cut down the additional posterior capsule support which is present while cutting uh, the open area so that is one important point uh, which should be taken into consideration when we are trying to do a vitreotomy through parts scanner in hard cataract so that is one thing that i just wanted to uh, i think that that is very important yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, that's a very important point you brought it out and my my suggestion is what you said is absolutely correct but please use a new brand new vitreotomy Please Absolutely. do not use the ET or sterile vitreotomy. It has to work, and it will work even if the reused one works. It actually doesn't cut. Absolutely. So, for example, I do a vitreotomy many times in pediatric cataract. It will not do a good job if it is a reused one. Even one use, it will spoil its efficiency. So, this is the eye uh, where you don't consider any money. or any any no compromise everything like transilenon this coat new vitreotomy and uh, when you remove the vitreotomy reduce the vacuum and keep the vitreotomy on a cut mode until the actual vitreotomy is out of the globe because if you are not cutting putting on a cutting mode you can incarcerate easily the vitreous strands and lisa showed it that very well lisa arbizer so when you remove the vitreotomy if i'm using 300 or 350 vacuum i will reduce it to 100 vacuum and keep it cutting all the time and then and then you take it out and when you're doing the vitreotomy i i forgot to mention use the highest cut rate of the machine why do you want to use the highest cut rate because that means there will be less time between the forward and backward movement so less chance of the vitreous being aspirated and that is not good so aspiration uh, will produce a traction on the retina so highest cut rate very minimal time in between uh, possible it could be 2000 4000 5000 the machine i have is a 5000 cut rate which is a cataract machine so the highest cut rate and and low flow rate you don't want a 35 cc flow rate and you need a very modest vacuum i say anything from 250 to 350 never more than that because that can produce a, a more aspiration you don't want aspiration remember and In and one more thing sir apart from a new vitrector a new trocar is also very essential because many times no no anything new no no Uh, if you have to keep pushing it and it becomes uh, the globe gets distorted and so you need to have a new trocar arshul wants to maximum yes. maximum yeah maximum intraoperative vitreotomy traction occurs at the entry point with a knife or with a trocar more with a trocar i recommend dork company's trocar although i use alcon uh, uh, machine generally but i recommend dork trocar they will they will sell you just a trocar and they are sharper and better than alcon trocar so trocar is a very important element even with this sharpest trocar available still uh, it is not sharp enough and you are therefore do not poke with one 
first like a karate. Go in a screwing motion gently and keep the IOP little high, either with the maintainer, uh, maintainer or a wrist coat or a sutured incisions and whatever, but globe should be very firm. Ashul, you uh, want to... Yes, ma'am. So uh, thank you, Abhay, sir, for uh, enlightening us. And it's always a great uh, teaching uh, to hear, Abhay, sir. And uh, I think two, three points I would like to add here that uh, Abhay, sir, has told that we need to get over some bad habits, uh, like, uh, like we do the... Uh, we use the Vexel sponge to cut the vitreous, which should not be done. Another one is like, uh, I've seen many people sweeping with the iris spatula. They try to sweep the uh, vitreous away from the incision, in incision wound, which should never be done because we all know that it definitely puts a lot of traction on the uh, vitreous base. And that peripheral retina is, uh, we all know, 100 times thinner than the central retina. Puts a lot of traction, as Dr. Abhay has shown has shown that uh, it can cause retinal tear and detachment. And uh, secondly, uh, I think uh, we, if we, even the surgeons were not using intracameral moxifloxacin, if there is vitreous prolapse and vitreous is there and they have done vitrectomy, intracameral moxifloxacin should be used. I think Abhay sir uh, has uh, proposed. Yeah, no, no, sure. yeah. you, you're actually right. I use intracameral with the mox or moxifloxacin uh, yeah. for many years. Uh, and I really learned from uh, my friend, Dr. Steve Ashnoff, uh, yes. who, who, who told me to start, and I did that. Yeah. Earlier, I was using uh, vancomycin, which I saw Dr. Gimbel when I visited him in 90s. So I used vancomycin, uh, but moxifloxacillin is superior as, to, as a newer molecule. But you're absolutely right. Uh, the risk of endophthalmitis is very high. So even if you're not using intracameral as a rule, uh, your suggestion is absolutely valid. Very good. Yeah. Uh, there is a question uh, here, and uh, they want to know that if we are anterior segment surgeons, I think this is a barrier in everybody's mind, and you did tackle it. Then uh, anything, I mean, that you do have to do pars plena, what should be the, uh, you know, uh, how should they go about it? Can all anterior segment yes. surgeons just venture into making a pars plena port? Or should, do you think they should practice it somewhere or, you know, how should they go about it to, to get rid of that fear factor, you know, that is there because anything going into the vitreous, you know, you are always scared. No, no, this is, this is the main stumbling block and you brought it out very well. I think first thing is tell yourself that if you are able to do limbal vitrectomy, in other words, if you are separating the irrigation uh, from the parasynthesis, and vitrectomy from other parasynthesis too. Now, you have to shift that vitrectomy port only three or 3.5 millimeter back. It is not different. Once you make that incision and enter, it is the same movement, same principle as you would have. Instead of irrigation, instead of uh, in limbo, it is just a millimeter away. So that's the first thing you keep telling your mind. Every time you think about past, then how, how can I do this? It's all mindset. Now, having done that, I've never actually made an incision. Well, if you're lucky, you can have an eyeball from the eye bank. That will be a better thing. Inject through a 30 cc, 30 gauge cannula, a heel on GV, spend some money into the vitreous cavities because eye, eyeballs from the eye banks are not very tough. So make it little firm, and I've done it in my wet lab. I did it myself. And then make a lens knife, and keep the globe on a Maloney's head. You must have Maloney's head, or ask the assistant to put in a gauze piece uh, uh, covered eyeball in the middle center, and, and aim, aim not the center of the pupil, but aim optic now, center of the globe, midpoint of the globe and make an incision right up to the mid-globe in that cadaver eye. And then second time, second, same globe, you can use it, suture that, and second time, this time you do not go lens knife right into the middle, but just enter enough and then come out, but direction same. So that is something will 
help you in real life. Now, the problem is that because we are so disturbed mentally, we forget that pressure in the eye is very important. Because these stroke cards and these knives with this sclera, which is once the vitreous is gone, the support of the globe. The vitreous has a reason. And the main function of the vitreous is to support the coats of the eye. And that coats of the eye, you are penetrating. So once the vitreous is disturbed, that support of the coat of the eye is gone. So close the main incision, close the paracentesis incision. If you think it's not a valvular incision, tunnel, some people do a paracentesis like a stab. Do not ever make it any incision, however small it is, even one millimeter, always produce a tunnel incision, even in a paracentesis. Because by the way, the commonest entry of the contaminants in first two hours of the operation post-op is through the paracentesis. Because everybody concentrates on main incision and they do a valve, but nobody bothers. They just do a chip. Don't do that. Imagine, take your time and make a tunnel. External incision and internal incision should have a one millimeter or more in a paracentesis. So you don't need to suture it, but main incision, which is less than two millimeter or at least two, you need to suture many times before you enter the globe. Put a, a maintainer and then inject. Uh, if you already have a wrist coat in it, inject more wrist coat, but make sure the globe is firm. And then, then remember your cadaver eye experience and do that. So this is the way, but once you enter, remember it is the same thing, like the limbo you have done before. Just forget where is the vitrectomy. You see the vitrectomy coming into the pupil. Whether it is coming from back of the iris or front, doesn't matter to you now, because you have the same experience like two-port vitrectomy. You are doing a two-port vitrectomy now. Forget if it's parse plan or limbo. And continue doing with your <clears throat> removal as you've done. So this is the way if you are doing surgery under topical anesthesia and you need to do yeah. pass plana vitrectomy, how do you augment okay. like use? No, you don't, you don't need to augment anything. Don't. No, no, wait a minute. First of all, first of all, I want to clear this myth. The pain patient has is because of the two reasons. One is the uveal touch. Or when you try to enter sclerotomy with whatever hypotonian more force. So if you have a good IOP, and I would recommend 40 millimeter IOP at least, and a sharp knife, and intracameral lignopane, which I use as a routine anyway. I use all my cataract surgery, and my regime is Gel in the preoperative time, 2% xylocard jelly. On table, before I start, 2% lignocaine. And once I enter the eye, I use 1% lignocaine preservative free. So once there is a PCR and you need to do vitrectomy, while you're preparing, along with all the viscoat and other thing, inject once again, top it up again with intracameral one person lignocaine. Just to cover up that scleral buckle and folding. Once you're in, if you do not touch the iris, will not have any pain. Patient will not know that you had a retraction. And I have to believe me. I always keep telling what Dr. Kelvin taught, told me when we had a coffee with I had a privilege, by the way, I don't want to show up, but I had the privilege of having a lunch one-to-one -one with Kelman before, because I propagated Kelman Teep many years ago. And he said, who is it? I never knew Kelman Teep is that good. Invite me. So he said, when a PCR happens, I tell, my dear, keep still, you are doing well, already vitreous is out. Keep still because your support is vain and you can be in trouble. He does retract from me, he does everything, and he keeps telling, <laughs> my dear, don't panic, you're very nervous, this cool, and so on. So, you know, patient doesn't even know that you're done retracting. So remember, you will touch of any kind, direct or indirect, is the reason for all the trouble 
on table and later on. Because you see the posture segment surgeons do so much of the tracheotomy, four pores, three pores, one hour, two hours, they don't have any problem later on post-operatively. Why we have that as a cataract surgeon when we do the vitrectomy? That's because two reasons. One, we are not removing antivitreous properly. We are not respecting that vitreous removal process, the path we take and so on. And we damage the uveal tissue or traumatize the right. right? OK. So I think uh, there is again a question here that if you do have a PCR and you beautifully showed that you can still implant PC IOLs, if you can't on the table, if it's a large PC uh, ring, then what would be your choice or how would you go about it? Would you do an AC IOL or would you plan an IOL at a later date or would you rather do a glued IOL, yes. which Priya, you know, is, he, Priya is yes. the one who's a pioneer of? So what would be your take on that? Yeah, I think this is this is this is a reality problem. All this lecture and theory, okay, but here is a situation and the PCR. And what happens is many times the pupil becomes small, and even if you use the adrenaline or whatever concentration, it doesn't. So make sure first of all that you have a view behind the eyes. So I didn't show you, but if you're interested, I have this white cataract where I did vitrectomy first thing. I use with the retractors at the end to see is there a capsule support. So assess the remaining capsule support and you may have to use the retractor even at the very end after removing. So if you have a good support and an intact capsule rectus, intact capsule rectus is a prerequisite. If you have an intact capsule rectus, you put this three-piece haptic in the front of the anti-capsule and optic in front. If the capsule is uh, not that big, you can capture the optic through that. But many times it won't be possible. Or next scenario, if the entry capsule is split, it's not intact. The posterior capsule is ruptured, entry capsule is split. Do not put the IOL in front of the capsule support. There may be enough capsule you may see, but do not put it because a compromised entry capsule, I mean the tear, torn entry capsule, will not be able to keep the IOL stable and quite often it will produce a white pearl phenomena, auto-rotate, and the lens will slip into the vitreous. I have done it, and I have produced enough to tell you, now is the time to consider transsteral fixation with Gore-Tex suture, 10 on nylon, 9 on nylon, 6 O and 5 proline, depending upon your experience, or use what Amar Agarwal and Priyanarayan propagated glued IOL, and I use it to my comfort, and I like intraspells. However, I use now and prefer Yamani technique. So either glued IOL or uh, Yamani, but intraspells fixation is the way to go. If you are not trained or if you are not confident, do not put lens anywhere. Do not use that capsule support if it is strong enough, as I told you. And leave it a fake, but do a good retraction with the glaucoma and the uveitis and macular edema is taken care. Use intracameral uh, steroid a little bit, transiloron, even at the risk of glaucoma, because you can treat that glaucoma. But you don't want macular edema and inflammation. And then ring your friend. You know, in same, uh, before you take a coffee, the diet problem, when can I send you? Or in the evening, I have a clinic in the evening, send it, or next day. And then you plan out with him, or somebody like Priya, Priya, would you help me to fix the lens? And she would be delighted to do that. So limit, know your limits. Do not have an ego and tell the patient. Now the question is, what do I tell? Because I promised, and I promised, uh, Panoptic lens, I will promise the BBT lens and, and, and lens sex and whatever. But mm -hmm. here I am unable to do a lens of any kind. Well, that's where you need to be truthful to yourself, honest, but not stupidly honest. <laughs> and that's where, the art, that's where the art of the medicine will come. You have to tell the patient, number one, first thing, and the relatives. Now, patient, you tell on the table. And remember Kelman's story, 
you keep doing whatever you can at the end announce the dear i think uh, i assess your everything and i think i i'll be able to fix the lens even now but i think it will be an interest in your safety that you will get a better vision and outcome if i uh, do it little later on uh, because of so and so so tell that your support was weak and i managed that luckily thank god your idea everything is fine but i think for the safety you can put the lens outside then send the patient outside you have a coffee in between because you are sweating you need one once it is done you go out and see the relatives patient is your ambassador patient has already told the relatives that you know i didn't have a lens but doctor did tell me that my support was weak and he could not see this pre operatively because it's not possible to assess the support it's only on table one in 500 cases although it could be one in 100 in your case doesn't matter so when you go you tell the put your hand on the patient's shoulder and say how are you are pain no pain i did you feel any pain no you know that he didn't feel, feel the pain and then tell the wife or parents or son and say you know surgery has gone very well i'm very happy to tell you that uh, thank god in spite of the big support uh, i could remove the lens and uh, uh fine even if there is a little drop fragment because you know that you're going to contact uh, alai banker or manish or anybody else <laughs> later on so you say they have done the good surgery but we will need a lens later on and we might do depending upon what uh, the vessel colleague has shown or told you when you're taking coffee tomorrow or a week or a month or whatever and uh, everything is fine so but do not put lens and do not have an ego issue be honest and truthful because but you need to be a little bit dishonest but you are not dishonest but you are you are for the patient's uh, psychology you are not revealing uh, that i rapt you you didn't rapt you actually the capsule was fragile the zonules were weak you didn't do anything in spite of your best experience the zonules ruptured the capsule broke away that's all your fault don't feel criminal don't it's not your fault that you ruptured the capsule remember always 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 the support was weak and therefore it gave way in spite of the best machine i have and all the lens checks and you you paid very heavily and so on and do not make it a free operation by the way because that means it's a indirect way of signing your guilt so you don't feel guilty about rupturing the capsule please mm -hmm. i have felt guilty my 69 years for last year and a half i'm i'm learning I should not have done that all my life. So please take my latest tip. Do not feel guilty about the complication which occurs during the surgery. You did your best. You had the best intention, best machine, best skill, best experience. You are one of the best. And still, it can happen. I think okay. the, this was the uh, the best message of the better, day. This was better. <laughs> this was better than the bull experiment. No, no, no. <laughs> जिकल <laughs> outcome is or whatever has happened so i think uh, that was really required so we were being watched by uh, 15 uh, countries so i will send you the list of the countries and of course there were so many people on the facebook on the youtube uh, youtube was the highest uh, which was expected sir that it would be because of the top, because of you being there as a master no 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 yeah. 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 as i told you earlier you have been an exemplary with your team i must give credit to entire team uh, rajesh president and the scientific committee part and everybody but but uh, i saw the visible change once this uh, not that earlier events were anywhere in fear they did a great job but you took it to a higher or a higher you, level sir. without Thank any disrespect to the uh, previous uh, my friend the markable the team work the entire aos that we all are so proud thank you so much sir rajesh would you would any of the panelists want to ask anything uh, or comment not not ask but i would just like yeah. to say that 
it was a great learning experience for us we always look up to him as somebody who is a role model for all of us and uh, a lecture wherein we are directly involved and interacting with him and you know uh, you know the the finer nuances this very small little things which we when you start doing and you feel that how to do those things have been told so so i, I must say that you know there can be some lectures wherein certain very uh, big uh, things can be told but these finer nuances are missed but here he told exactly where should be the direction of the trocar and all those things which are very important so multiple small little tips which have added and they are definitely going to help everyone to improve the you know outcome of the surgeries and of course the last tip as you said sir then you know you have to explain to the patient very well that is also very essential so i guess it was one of the best uh, webinars i have attended wonderful yeah. sir i think uh, as abhay sir has said apart from pico dynamics it's the psycho dynamics also which play a very important role in situation like this perfect yeah because patient counseling is the main thing that comes up yes yes you need to satisfy them answer them all their questions their uh, method of treatment in future in recent future what we are going to do absolutely i think it was a brilliant talk and i just loved it it was wonderful yeah i think you know uh, you have uh, one two minutes now because this is my favorite yeah, topic yeah thanks sir no problem uh, yeah the thing is the, this psychodynamics uh, what uh, she said it it is not for pcr now as a good human being as a good clinician yeah. treating caring the patient it is our moral duty ethical duty scientific duty and legal duty to keep the patient well informed at every stage of the care and management we take if i am my patient would you not like to be told so remember when you see a patient across the slit lamp and this is uh, dr nakpa teaching when you see a patient across the table remember it is you would you do this or when you see a complication a serious complication uh, and patient typically with so much of a bad culture and, and most of us including me have a bad culture they abuse the surgeon and the thing by abusing the previous surgeon they will get get uh, it uh, you see that that surgeon is could be could have been you yourself producing this complication or this treatment so remember uh, if you keep to this basics you won't have to do any tricks or tell stories only thing is you will have to learn the art of talking and, and uh, there was a very good editorial in in lancet some time ago called human aspects of medicine and we all are missing human aspects of medicine in this modern times uh, which is industry driven uh, mainly but mainly commercialization and, and the competition which rather than competing with the with the skill and delivering quality care we compete with with the pricing we compete with this kind of uh, publicity and so on so that 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 removes the human aspects of medicine and this is one example so arshul thank you so much for bringing that uh, uh, what you call the uh, psychodynamics which was a new term for me but you know what i mean <laughs> thank you yeah psychodynamics i think was coined just now it was a new term for all of us <laughs> rather than coining the term which which is very good and you are innovator also but but remember the basics if you stick yeah, to the true. basics you won't have to do anything different particularly in a difficult situation because your routine your reflex is your 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 way you practice uh, and it is it is a mental reflex if you establish it's, it's like the paulo's reflex if you keep telling the same thing 100 times you will never go wrong when you actually need that because it will come to you like a natural reflex but if you're not doing and you just bring it out today and bring out a story uh, which which can work but uh, better is this other one 
So thank you so much, sir. And uh, thank you. We would uh, put it on the IOS website as well as for our archives on the clinical education material. Thank you. Thank and you I would like time. to thank uh, Dr. Harshal, Dr. Priya, and Dr. Rajesh, and our team, uh, Dr. Anand Sethi at the back end, who manages the audiovisual, and uh, Mr. Kripal Rana from our headquarter team. So, hope to have you, sir, for another uh, of your master class. And uh, thank you so much today. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And thank you. Happy once again, happy thank Independence you. Day to all of you. Yeah. Happy Independence yeah. Day to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.